apologies for that delay start there but i think we're live i think we're good to go what is up everybody how's it going appreciate you guys being here and joining me today um thanks for for being here so again today's session is brought to you and sponsored by the generative ai world summit which takes place at the MLOps World Summit in Austin, Texas. This is from October 25th through October 26th, and there is a virtual component. Uh, so definitely check that out. You can use the discount code HARPREET, all lowercase, for $75 off your ticket price. Um, this session today is themed generative AI in production best practices and lessons learned. This is going to discuss the practical aspects of deploying generative AI solutions, the challenges and lessons learned. Uh, I'm looking forward to this panel. If you guys got questions at any point, you can feel free to drop them in the live stream in the chat or uh, feel free to come off mute and uh, ask your question there. We also have a Slido that you can ask questions at. So go ahead and enter your questions up there or you can also um, upvote questions if there's not a question that uh, that you want to ask. And now let's go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. First up is Miriam Eric. Miriam is a recovering physicist, co-founder, and CEO of Titan ML. Titan ML is an NLP development platform that focuses on the deployability of large language models, allowing businesses to build smarter and cheaper language model deployments easily. Miriam, thank you so much for being here again. Great to have you. Deploying LLMs is literally my favorite topic. Next so up, really we excited. got. Uh, oh, I think I think my technology. I tell you all, man, this is this is this technology. <laughs> so up, we have uh, Greg Lochnane. Greg is a generative AI and LLM educator. Uh, he's helping people become AI engineers by building, shipping, and sharing large language model applications. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for being here. Next up, we have uh, Alicia Visnik. Alicia is CEO of YLabs, the market leader in AI observability. Uh, for AI teams at companies like Square and Glassdoor. Uh, they use YLab's uh, platform to ensure AI models from classification to LLMs are generating accurate, fair, and safe customer experiences. Uh, Alicia, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate you taking time to join us. Next up, we have Chris Alexiak. Chris is uh, also known as the LLM wizard. Uh, he's an educator extraordinaire. He was uh, previously an instructor and curriculum developer at Fourth Brain and is currently a founding ML engineer at Ox and the CTO at AI Makerspace, where Greg is also the uh, the CEO. Uh, just a quick shout out for AI Makerspace. It's amazing. Uh, I went through one of their courses, uh, the LLM Ops course, and uh, learned a ton. Um, so you know, shameless plug for them. Those guys are awesome, doing amazing work. Uh, next up, we got Hannes Hapke. He's the principal machine learning engineer at Digits. Uh, he's implemented deep learning systems from inception to production and has authored two books, Building ML Pipelines and NLP in uh, Action. Hannes, thank you so much for, for being here. Appreciate you joining us today. And finally, we've got uh, VA Tulos. He's the co-founder and CEO of Outer Bounds, a human-centric platform for data, ML, and AI projects. And this is based on uh, Metaflow, which is a open source project that he started while working at ML Infra and Architecture at Netflix. My friends, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Appreciate you guys joining us. So let's uh, let's jump right into it. So uh, let's start with with the the easiest question ever advice for somebody uh so you know i wonder what advice you guys would give to someone who's looking to build uh maybe a new generative ai powered product or feature or maybe they're trying to you know start an initiative to, to build this out in their organizations uh what advice would you give to them um you know what steps would would you advise someone take in order to understand the feasibility of of uh, of a project or maybe you know the how to think of this as an actual real world uh, application. So let's start off by going to uh, VA, then we'll go to Hans, Chris, and then Greg. So VA, let's uh, hear from you. Oh, wow, I get to be the first one. Well, I'm, thank, thank you for that. Um, well, 
I mean, first, I, I definitely do want to preface that like all of this is, is so very new that it's, it's kind of interesting that um, we have been having so much talk about Gen AI and LLMs over the past, I don't know, like a six months, nine months and so forth. But I mean, it's so new to everybody that it all, almost like it feels a bit in a, inappropriate to give like any kind of advice, like from a place of experience. I, I, I don't think that there are like anyone like with, with five years of experience in putting LLMs in production. One, one thing that like really excites me um, is that overall, given that we are in such early days, uh, there are like so many like totally new interaction patterns that like we haven't even in investigated. I think we have only scratched the surface with this like a chatbot paradigm that was studied by ChatGPT. So, so I, I, I think like if you think about like this thing in the kind of terms of like explore and exploit, I think that like we are still very much in the exploration phase. I mean, there are certain applications that uh, may be a bit more in the exploit phase, but I, I would definitely like to see like much more like a crazy explorations around like a Gen AI and LLMs and like all kinds of the new interaction patterns, like even like a reimagining product experiences with all these new capabilities. So in, in, in that sense, I mean, like, at this point, I mean, the, the advice is that like people, people should like just like go crazy and like try out all kinds of things. And like, of course, one thing is that like, instead of just like hitting the same APIs, I mean, like even try to do things at home and like see how, how far they can push the limits. So at least I, I find that very exciting. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate your, your input there. Let's go next to uh, to Hannes. And uh, by the way, any panelists, if you guys want to jump in at any point um, to, to you know, kind of partake in the discussion, feel free to use the raise hand icon and I'll go ahead and call on you. Uh, let's go to Hannes now. I very much agree with that. It's like hard to give advice when everything is so new and uh, developing by the minute, basically. Um, but a couple of things we observed in the, in the last couple of months is like, um, start with like some like some open um, um, like an api for example open ai to test out if this product is even having any traction before you start developing your own lms before you start fine tuning things right it's like there's a lot of costs involved with like tuning and then especially with hosting those models um so i think the fine tuning is the, the cheaper uh fraction of the overall costs but then all of a sudden you're running larger gpus than for general classification models um and so you want to you want to make sure that those those costs are warranted. Um, the other thing is when once you have them once you start fine tuning your own model, look for the known unknowns. Um, what that means is we can talk about this later about a couple of observations we had in the past. But like, look for things which the, try to provoke the model in a certain way. Right? It's like a, normally with like. Um, um, sort of like classical machine learning, we have a validation set, um, we do classifications, the model would produce a likelihood for a given set of labels. There's hardly anything what can happen uh, in, in, that, in that realm. But now here we're working with language models where it could generate those crazy stories. Um, and we have some more stories later on to share, but like I would heavily advise on like look for the unknown or the known unknowns. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go now to uh, to to Chris. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to, to hearing your advice. Go for it, Chris. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have some kind of maybe uh, anti hype advice. So we got some some hype advice, and I I'd say like the the biggest thing that I could advise someone to do is getting into Gen AI is like really make sure you need Gen AI. Really make sure that this is a space that you need to be operating in and make sure that like as much as of your stack that you can uh is is using tried and true methods that have worked for a very long time and we know add value we know how they add value uh i think you know a, a lot of cases right now are really reaching for the big guns uh you know to to do even small components of your stack uh, whereas they could be, you know, you could use a traditional ML model or you could use just application logic to handle a lot of those processes, you know, integrating with your own APIs uh, for things like search and, and, and other kinds of like augmentation methods before going, going whole hog into the Gen AI uh, world. And then on top of that, like uh, edge, edge case testing and like red teaming become a much more prevalent part of the stack. Uh, so when you do get your application, when you do get your 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 generative, you know, experience prepared, like the way that you have to test it and the kinds of tests you have to run are very distinct from uh, what you might do in like a normal application flow, uh, making sure that 
you know, your users can't find a way to use it in a way that you wouldn't uh, want or expect them to, to use it. Yeah, and just kind of stacking on, you know, some of that, Chris, I mean, kind of going back to the basics is really, I think, what we want to kind of think about. Just because it's generative AI powered doesn't mean it's not AI powered and doesn't mean we're not just building a product at the end of the day for some user. So digital product management, the fundamentals, like try to get that thing MVP as quick as you can. Try to get it out to people that can actually leverage the thing. Start giving you feedback as quick as you can. And I would say sort of a gold standard for this is try to go ahead and take one to two days to get the quickest, dirtiest prototype that you can, you know, and, and this is going to be easier and easier with time as the level of abstraction you can build at continues to go up. But these low code, no code tools, there's, there's even the high code tools. There's a lot of resources out there that people are creating all the time to get you up and running really quickly. So that's number one. And then, you know, number two is always if you don't have a business application that you're like, I know I'm going to create a ton of value for my company, or I'm going to go create the startup and I'll make millions of dollars and create billions in revenue. That's okay. Just start with something that you really are super into yourself, right? Like, like I really like running or, you know, I know Chris really likes D and D for instance, it's like, start with a community of folks that you're into and that you really resonate with and start with data related to that. And then let those folks be your first users and your early adopters. It's an easier way to get started. And, you know, it's, it's, really comes down to how you measure value. And there's a lot of ways to create value for a lot of people that don't really have to do with money these days. So let your curiosity lead you and a uh, quick MVP. Build, ship, and share, man. That's the motto. Uh, thank you so much, Greg. Appreciate the, uh, the input there. Yeah, joining communities, I think, especially at, at this stage in the game where everything is so new and everybody's trying to figure stuff out, like being part of communities and then just... Uh, bouncing ideas off people is super critical, super important. Uh, so, Greg, thank you. Let's uh, uh, see if uh, either uh, Miriam or, or Alicia want to chime in here. If not, I've got another question queued up here. Um, so, we'll, yeah, Miriam. Yeah, I, I what I always suggest when um, we have, like, when we speak to teams that are wanting to build Gen AI for the first time and they've identified that it's uh, the right thing to do, I'll echo, um, you know, some of the on my other comments that you want to prototype as quickly as possible but you know using an api is by far the best way to get uh, up and running um another thing that i'll also flag is a lot of the value in llms doesn't come from the model itself which seems like magic but comes from the system and the product you build around it um and even if we just forget the product and just think about the system, so thinking about how we use RAG, thinking about uh, the ways in which we have models interact with each other is really interesting and actually provides a huge amount of the value. Um, so we've found that actually spending half an hour or an hour whiteboarding with someone that's been there and done that and done it before, like some of the people on this panel, for example, is actually a really good way to figure out what's the best way to architect my system you know, what should I be fine tuning versus what should I not? And then, then you go and try and build it because you can go down the road a couple, you know, a couple thousand dollars down the line where you've tried to fine tune something and it didn't really work when actually there was a solution, you know, using a BERT model that would have been better. Um, so prototype with APIs and then also system design really, really matters. Whiteboard it with an expert. Thank you. Uh, Alicia? If only, uh, if only one thing to add here, and I think all of these are super, super excellent advice. Uh, I think Greg mentioned right away that you need to prototype and prototype prototype was mentioned a few times. Uh, one thing that I see often is uh, once you identify some kind of improvement that you can make to your prototype, you're often not well positioned to actually implement that improvement. So think about how you're going to actually iterate on what you build. So if it means that, you know, it's a very, very simple, um, you know, V0.1 experience that is composed of a bunch of uh, open APIs. How are you going to incorporate feedback? Let's say a particular user segment, the suffering, or you're seeing that your 
uh, responses uh, are toxic or your model is prone to um, adversaries, how you're actually going to incorporate that and improve your application, thinking about that as early as possible is key. Thank you. Lisa, honest, let's start uh, if you. Uh, yeah, I totally concur with uh, Alicia on this. Uh, we have this phrase here, which is where we say like uh, the project, the ML project starts when you have to deploy the model for the first time, because it's easy to train the first iteration, but then making sure that you keep the model up to date and that it doesn't go off the rail with the user feedback. Uh, that's the hard part. So totally, very much agree with there. Please. And there was definitely consensus to, uh, that I've picked up from from last discussion, and it's uh, one go with an API provider, two go with you know building out a prototype quick as possible and, and get it out there. Uh, before I touch on the you know prototype aspect, you know I'm wondering if you have any tips for for picking the right API or picking the right provider. Um, you know, th there's more than just open AI out there, right? There's there's uh, the AI twenty one, for example, and and anthropic, and so on and so forth. That uh, cohere even like how do we pick which one to use? Uh, Miriam, let's hear from you. Like my view on this, and a, a lot of what our clients have said is that GPT four is by far the best model, and that if you can't do it with GPT four through prompting, the chances are you probably can't do it at all. Um, so I, I I think you know start from GPT four. I don't necessarily think it's a great place to build production apps. Um, we've seen that models change quite frequently. We've also seen, um, you know, in Europe anyway, there's some concerns about it being hosted outside the EU. Um, but prototype with GPT four is the best and easiest way to do it, and then figure out what you want to do with your use case, whether it's fine tuning, whether it's just prompting an open source model, or whether it's using one of the other providers. Um, but I, I I think in terms of quality, there's not much beating OpenAI right now. Thank you. Uh, Miriam, anybody else have any tips? Um, so yeah, let's jump into talking about uh, going from, from prototype then into a actual product. So um, what are some of the challenges that that you've seen come up, some common challenges when you're trying to translate this generative AI product feature prototype into like a production ready product, um, into something that's actually going to you know, generate value. Uh, let's go to uh, Vile and then Chris, Greg, followed by Alicia. Uh, Vile. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I, I can just echo like what um, I think Alicia mentioned here before that um that it's it's all about iteration I, I i think like we oftentimes talk about production as if it was a binary event that there is like before production and after production and then like after production is just like we don't have to care about it is very much of a fact that everything interesting happens after production but it also means that we shouldn't be scared i, I think oftentimes we just make a production like kind of almost it's like a boogeyman that like everything has to be perfect like rather than having the mindset that is pretty with something as new as, as these llms I mean, in, in, in some ways, I could even like provocatively say that like we can go like a production like a day one because everything is going to be kind of in a way, I mean, like a so rudimentary anyways, that really the question becomes that like, how are you able to iterate these models? And then it's pretty like kind of in a field that moves this fast today, it may be <clears throat> Lama 2, I mean, like maybe next spring, it will be Lama 3, Lama 5, like Lama and, and so forth. And who knows what other models? And then the question is that, like, let's say, like, a new model comes along and, like, you want to start testing it. Of course, you don't want to make a switch overnight and, like, just move from that model to the new model. Maybe you want to run them side by side. You have the capability of, like, doing this type of AP testing and monitoring them side by side. And, and then, like, how do you how do you deal with that situation? And also, the other big one is that what do you do, like, when the results are not good enough? I mean, like, let's say you get too many hallucinations. So maybe there's a class of prompts that, like, produce... Uh, absolutely like horrible answers systematically like like what is actually like the whole like a tool chain of actually going back and noticing those issues and fixing those issues and then like starting to even think that like maybe the, the foundation model that we are using is just like a fundamentally incapable of producing good answers to a class of questions what do you do then and like really kind of thinking of, of those type of like a human workflow questions is super important yeah, thanks yeah. so much uh yeah chris let's go for it Definitely, definitely echo what uh, what was just said. I mean, the the other things I think that are, uh, I would say, like common challenges are 
especially because in prototyping, you're probably using some kind of API. And then when you unleash it to the masses, uh, you know, there's a lot of very fun uh, rate limiting issues you can run into. There's a lot of very fun, uh, you know, latency issues you can run into. And, you know, you, you have to kind of think about that beforehand uh, a lot more than you would you would expect, especially with something like GPT-4. Uh, and then on top of that, it's to, to kind of back up the, the point we just heard, like having the visibility or observability stack in place for the first time that you get it into the wild is so crucial so you can have good a, a good idea of how it's being used when it's being used why it's being used and you're able to track the or trace the whole interaction uh, that your users are going through because you know your users are going to try to use it in some way you didn't think of or you didn't expect and being able to know that they're doing that quickly and find a way to address it is huge and this speaks back to a point we heard in the previous question, which is, you know, these systems are very modular. They're they're little uh, Lego blocks that we're we're piping together. You know, not to to oversimplify, but um, being able to know which Lego block handles which part of the application uh, is is crucial. Knowing where it's failing is the the thing that I think people struggle most with when transitioning from that prototype stage to the production stage, and of course. Uh, I, maybe we should, we should all just say this, but, uh, iteration and improvement, constant iteration and improvement is, uh, is necessary, uh, with these systems, they don't behave in a deterministic way. So, uh, they're going to do stuff we didn't expect and we're going to have to fix it uh, and you got to be ready to do it. Thank you, Chris. Uh, actually let's, you know, just speaking on the topic of observability, uh, we have someone here that actually built an entire company on observability. So let's do this. Let's go to Alicia followed by Greg. Uh, cause you know, I, I want to get your perspectives on, uh, observability here. Thank you. I was going to say, Chris really made it easy for me. So I don't have to like preach observability. Um, I, you know, I, I think Mostly people are uh, fairly bought into the idea of observability, but uh, Gen AI and LLMs overall make this ever harder. So like I've been at Wildlabs for four years and I feel like we spent four years, uh, maybe three out of those years, convincing people that uh, what Chris said is a real deal and that you need observability before you even get to production. And now with LLMs, uh, everybody is bought in, but nobody knows what to measure. And uh, I hate to, well, you know, maybe I'll quote the good old, uh, what gets measured gets managed quotes, because there are all kinds of things that you can measure and you can go down all kinds of rabbit holes, optimizing and improving. And I see some teams, you know, measure the easy things like, oh, what's our token usage and what's our latency? I mean, who cares? Uh, may, maybe somebody cares, but in the end of the day, it's about user experience and whether whatever you're, whatever is this thing that's powered by your wonderful favorite LLM uh, or some other uh, Gen AI experience is actually delivering value. So I would say when it comes to observability, surprisingly, uh, you have to go back to basics and determine two, three things that actually reflect whether your app or this experience is useful to the user. And that could mean something as simple as uh, having like thumbs up or thumbs down, like the good, you know, ChatGPT has, or even measuring the interactions that the user has with, with this experience. If it's like a summarization experience, for example, you could see distance to edit and things like that. Uh, refreshes if you allow for more interactive experiences. Measuring these things very early on, I mean, in, in your prototype, in your alpha, in your beta, uh, as soon as you can, as super key, because that indicates whether the money that you're spending on actually building this experience uh, is useful to the person. And then uh, Chris also said that the stack tends to be complicated and these systems are very modular. So actually measuring some amount of metrics between kind of the translation points in your stack is also key because if you know, you're building a bunch of post-processing on your raw LLM response, all kinds of things can go wrong. And if you are, for example, fine tuning and distilling things with your own data, if you're feeding it bad quality data, again, um, you'd be surprised, but you would get very bad uh, outcomes from that. So instrumenting kind of across the stack because it's so modular is also key. 
Let's hear from Greg. Alicia, thank you so much. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I think everybody's pretty much nailing it here. I think, you know, when we talk about most common challenges, it's it's really kind of deciding what that what that dividing line between prototype and production is. I love this ML starts once you deploy it in production. And it's certainly not binary. And, and I think one of the things we see a lot is that, you know, with LLMs, everything is more dynamic, not less. So we went from static code to AI. Now we're with like generative AI. So it's going to do crazy things. And the only way to figure out what those crazy things are is to get it out there and get people using it in order to align it with humans. It's like you need to go put it in front of humans. Right. And you can sit there and do it with it by yourself all day and prompt it perfectly. But, you know, at the end of the day, like and, and I would say, honestly, I would push back a little bit on the observability thing. I mean, we teach it week one in, in our course. And so it's very important. But it's kind of like the if you don't have anything yet to observe, you know, or if you haven't observed it yet yourself, what's the point of automating observation? You know, so it's like go manual before you go magical, get that thing out there, get it in front of people, get it, talk to those people like real humans, and then in, make sure it's instrumented, make sure you know how to do that. But, you know, if you do it yourself, you'll figure out what you should be visible to, what you should be observing. And, you know, I think that's that's going to be part of the key. Now, if you're, on the other hand, in some ridiculously highly regulated environment, like some of our customers are that we deal with is like, yes, use open AI, get it up and running, learn it, use Langchain, get it up and running, learn it. It's like, but a lot of these people come in and they say, well, you know, I'm in this ridiculously highly regulated industry, or I'm in the federal government, and there's just no way I'm ever going to be able to use a cloud computing platform of any kind whatsoever. It's like, okay, well, you know, then don't do it with your data first, do it somewhere off your grid, hurry up and get it up and running. And, and you don't call it production necessarily, uh, but you can potentially infinitely scale that out and you can make it so whoever you work for would actually consider a cloud computing cl platform potentially if you could put it together in the right way. And it's never been easier. One of the things we, we amaze students, students with all the time is, is actually to make your endpoint scalable. If you just deploy on like a hugging face, you can just simply go put in SageMaker behind Hugging Face, and then boom, you've got a scalable production application. And if you don't have a stack already, that's what you should be doing. If you're going zero to one, like just do that. And it's not this big thing. So everybody wants to make it a big thing, but uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's not. And it, you should be able to go quickly to cross that dividing line and start iterating again, as everyone is saying. Greg, thank you. Uh, let's go to Miriam. I think this question of how you get from prototype to production is probably one of the hardest questions in Gen AI uh, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's so easy to get to to prototype. And secondly, because it is so difficult to get to production. And it's uniquely difficult to get to production largely because these lar large language models are so vast. Like they are so computationally expensive. And it means like production is like a nightmare um and we have this really really obvious trade-off that you have to make between cost latency and quality in language models um which isn't necessarily the case in like more traditional ml like our clients um either you know say my models are way way too slow or um my you know my the amount i'm spending is way too much i can't even get access to the gpus or i've had to use a 7 billion model even though a 70 is actually what i need um and these kinds of trade offs are absolutely horrible to solve um there are things we can do on the software layer but it is an the production problem is an incredibly difficult uh part of the journey um and i think it's fairly unique to uh generative ai that uh, prototyping is so easy to get to and production is so, so, so hard to get to. Miriam, thank you. Uh, Hans, let's, let's hear from you. Um, just to add to what Miriam was saying, like production is uh, hard from this hardware layer as well um, in terms of getting access to hardware. Um, it got a little bit easier, but this spring was incredibly difficult to find machines to train on and let alone hosting them 24 seven. So we would run, we would kick off fine tuning tasks and we would lose the machines 
left, right, and center because some other customer paid way more money on this. And at some point, it was not a money problem anymore. It was like, I call this the communism of machine learning. There was simply not enough hardware around. You could spend as much money as you wanted. It didn't exist. And um, luckily, it got a little better, but like, uh, you do have the constraints. And um, uh, to what Miriam said, like the, the trade-offs are real. Um, we have models where we would like to go bigger, but we know if we go bigger, then we can scale them um, because simply there is not, we can't allocate more machines to that particular pool. So um, it's, a, it's a major trade-off. The AI summer has brought about the GPU winter, it seems, uh, GPU drought. Um, so questions coming in here on, on the Slido. Um, one of them, uh, the easiest question by LLMs ever is, how do I evaluate the output of language models in production? Um, anybody want to take that on? I'll, I'll volunteer Chris for this one because uh, he's the wizard. Um, and if anybody wants to chime in after this, please feel free to uh, use the raise hand icon and um, have, have you guys there. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if uh, if anyone on the panel has the absolute answer, please let me know. Uh, that'd be great. But the you know the idea is that it's it is difficult to evaluate the output of a language model in production, and it requires you to know very well your use case, to know very well uh, what the model should be doing, to have these preset metrics like we we heard mentioned earlier that you know you're going to want to care about. Uh, but the when it comes to like how good is this output, I think my my only answer that's general and should work in most situations is user feedback is the best feedback you can get. It's the best metric you can get. Your users will tell you if your model is failing. They will tell you why it's failing or not. You know, they'll tell you how it's failing. Sorry, uh, you know they 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 won't be quiet about it. And so having an avenue. Uh, right from the the get go, that lets them tell you what their experience is and uh, and you know how different parts of the stack are impacting it, are uh, are are affecting their experiences. Like crucial. Uh, other than that, there's frameworks that are coming out every day. Uh, you know, you have like Ragus, you have uh, other tools that are basically using Ragus, uh, but they've called it a different thing. Uh, and the the idea of these tools is you know. We, we know that really big models are good at critiquing the outputs of smaller models. And so uh, you can leverage those resources to, uh, you know, find subsets of your, your, you know, queries that, or whatever, you know, system you have in place to see how it's happening. But again, uh, humans at some point are going to need to get involved and, and, and indicate what needs to change and how. Uh, yes, that's, that's what I would say. Chris, thank you. Uh, Hannes, I think I saw your hand up. Um, yeah, we uh, totally agree with uh, the human state of value of this. Um, for some use cases, we also asked the model to um, explain why it made a certain decision. So that helped uh, for the human understanding there. But um, when we talk about like automating uh, production machine learning life cycles, uh, we do need a metric. We do need some quality uh, metric to say like, is this model, do we even want to ask the human to evaluate, evaluate this model or not. And so what we used there was like a combination of two metrics. One is the, we have some example sentences for some prompts and we want some, um, some similarity, semantic similarity to our example sentences, but we want uh, a big difference in latent state distance. We don't want to repeat the same sentence we already generated. So we want to like sort of create, uh, ask the model to be more creative in terms of the answers. Uh, hoping that the grammar and, and the language is correct produced by the machine learning model. Um, and those two numbers co combined give us the metric, which allows us then to say like, okay, this model is now better than the previous one. Okay, let's put this forward to like a human review. Honest, thank you. Uh, Alicia, sorry, hand up, let's, let's hear from you. Yeah, I'd love to dovetail on what Hannah just said. So a good kind of framework of thinking when it comes to evaluation metrics is to think of one metric that you want to optimize. So, you know, every time you make a change, hopefully this metric uh, improves like your, I don't know, AUC in, in traditional models, but uh, depending on your use case. And then there's a whole bunch of other metrics that you can track that would help you understand 
how, like, what are some of the components of the overall metric that you're optimizing, or what are some of the uh, other indicators of how good uh, the the output is? Um, one place to look for different types of metrics could be Helm. So uh, famously, you know, that's that's the place where uh, all of the models get benchmarked, and Helm uh, is a combination of benchmarks, data sets, and metrics. Uh, but I think the the best uh, the best kind of aspect of Helm is that they have enumerated all the different evaluation metrics that you can kind of get started with. Uh, we have an open source library called Lankit uh, that makes it easy to calculate a ton of these metrics. And calculating the metrics is just one step. Uh, you know, looking at what moves the needle is, is very important. Identifying and kind of composing for your specific use case. You could be calculating, I don't know, Helm lists like I think 59 different metrics. Of course, you don't want to like sit there and try to optimize all over the place. Uh, pick one that you want to optimize, pick a handful that are important to you. And these could be as simple as like, what's the toxicity of my responses, right? Or like, I don't know, if you're building a chatbot for, um, like a healthcare website, you don't want this chatbot to be giving medical advice. Like you be, uh, you should be measuring things uh, around topics and uh, response similarity to like for topics that are not uh, that are not approved and things like that. So pick pick the things that would drive uh, the experience and you'd want to measure, and then pick one thing that you want to optimize. Alicia, thank you. Uh, another question that just came into the chat here. Uh, and it's uh, in case if we are fine tuning, not not rag our model. Uh, how often do we retrain our models? Uh, is there any best practices, or is it just based on output metrics, uh, Miriam? I guess the f first comment that I would say is based on like the framing of the question, um, which is that rag and fine tuning are, are not alternatives to each other. They, they have different purposes and we should treat them as having different purposes. So the way that I like to think about it is RAG is a really good way to get your model to know things, like know facts um, that are less likely to be wrong. And fine tuning is a really good way to get your model to kind of get the vibe of the situation. So when I say vibe, I mean like, you know, kind of understand domain specific terminology respond in the in the frame or the way that you want um um and that's very different to 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 like the uh, knowledge injection so when we think about how often we want to be fine tuning um it depends on like why you've asked the question if you are thinking um i want it to stay up to date with my knowledge well you probably shouldn't be using fine tuning you should probably be using some kind of rag uh, system uh, instead. That would be my comment. Miriam, thank you. If anybody else wants to jump in, please uh, let me know. Uh, Chris, I'll just I'll just echo that because it's a very important point, right? Uh, Rag is what we use to teach our model new knowledge. Fine tuning is what we use to teach our models how to output uh, the kinds of outputs we want in the way we want or the structure we want. Um, and when it comes to when do I fine tune, when do I retrain, when do I all of these things, it, you really have to have that evaluation pipeline set up for that. You you have to know what part of your model is failing or what part of your system is failing. For instance, if you have like, uh, you know, if you're if you're able to measure metrics that are indicating to you, I'm getting the right context but my model's not giving me the correct kinds of responses, right? That's a good way for us to know, okay, at that point, I should be thinking about fine tuning my model, right? But if we know that we're getting the wrong contexts and our you know, our outputs are, are also bad, let's try to fix the easy problem first, right? Instead of fine tuning, let's try to get that context up to snuff and then uh, see what we're, what we're working with after that. But I think it is... Uh, it's just a point well worth echoing that like, you know, these systems are very powerful. And the I think someone said this earlier already, but the the R part of RAG, right, the retrieval uh, part of RAG is the uh, the highest leverage part of that system. Most LLMs are, quote unquote, smart enough to to nail the right answer with the right context. And so 
you know, let's spend those engineering hours improving the, the system we know is going to provide value as opposed to burning cash and, and, and maybe getting the results uh, we want. Chris, thank you. Let's go to uh, Vile. Yeah, no, I, I think that those comments uh, very much make sense. Maybe like one additional point that I want to make is that, of course, the question kind of reminds me of the questions that people were asking about traditional ML about seven years ago. Seven years ago, I mean, people were that like kind of a, how often do I have to retrain my fraud detection model or how often I have to retrain my sentiment classifier. And I, I think like what's kind of maybe baked into that question is that like because fine tuning is so expensive and so hard, I hope I don't have to do it too often. But, but I mean, of course, like an interesting question is that let's assume that over time, fine tuning will become cheaper, like maybe even to the point that it doesn't have to be so painful. Then the question becomes that like purely putting the kind of like technical and infrastructure questions aside, how often would you do it like if you didn't have any of these technical limitations? And uh, probably the answer is not all the time. I mean, all the discussions still about the RAG and, and so forth applies, but it's pretty like I think in the product experience point of view, uh, like, yeah, I mean, in many cases, it might be that like, especially like if your data distribution, the prompt distribution is changing quite rapidly. Yes, I mean, like you, you should be optimally like kind of doing it as often as needed. But then of course, I mean, there are these technical and cost considerations today, but I mean, especially like when building applications that may be lasting like kind of for years to come, I mean, maybe it might be useful to take that mindset that like the situation may, might, may not be as bad as it's today, like for four years to come. Yule, thank you. Uh, question coming in here. Um, uh, I'll shoot this over to Chris, because I think it's based on what you had said uh, about the R and retrieval and it's, um, uh, how to how to optimize the retrieval system how do i optimize the retrieval system yeah that's another million dollar question uh you know but in without being uh you know kind of cheeky about it or whatever like it really depends on your data it depends on what kinds of things you're retrieving it depends on what you want to do with those retrieved whatever is that you're you're getting back uh you know when it comes to i think this is you know we we were at a, a an event earlier today talking to data scientists and like what is the data scientist's role in today's uh in today's gen ai world well understanding the data that you need to do retrieval on understanding what to do with that data how to process it chunk it how to you know what kind of retrieval strategies you should use uh should you use like these more complicated retrieval st strategies where we're we're actually looking at summarizations of a big document and, and then going from there um you know, this is what the data scientist is going to be doing and having access to those those kind of platforms that let us see how people are using our application is going to point us in a very good direction in terms of, you know, what what is the knowledge the user is actually looking for here and how do we get that knowledge to our context window as fast and efficiently as possible. Um, so there are a lot of different optimizations that you can you can do. I look at people like uh, you know uh, Llama Index. They're doing webinars every third day on a on a cool new retrieval strategy. Uh, you know that you can you can take the guts of and implement in whatever tool stack you use. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to really understanding what's the structure of your data, what kinds of data do you have, and what kinds of context do you need to answer users' queries. And uh, that's a a question that you get better at answering with every user query uh and so it's uh, just to add another you know check mark to observability is important in gen ai yes thank you so much uh let's go to the next question here about um you know we, we talked about different tools and, and things like that observe or you know observability being one of those things that we need to have, but are there any other specific tools, platforms, or, you know, infrastructure components that you found to be indispensable uh, when you're moving from prototype to production? Um, and especially again, in, you know, with respect to generative AI powered products or, or features, uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to uh, Alicia, then we'll go to uh, Chris, and then Vile. There's so many things to to mention. I'm just trying to like fine tune my own brain to make sure we're not repetitive. Um, all right. I mean, actually, one thing that's again not obvious, and I think we haven't called out. So we talk a lot about kind of the 
the pipelining behind getting the LLM stuff to work. And we talk very little about user interfaces and user experiences because that tends to be very different as well, right? Potentially you're working with uh, not just like somewhat deterministic, but non somewhat non-deterministic, but extremely non-deterministic system. And whatever it outputs could be absolute garbage, could be not just you know, garbage in the way that it doesn't work, it could be very offensive garbage or very dangerous garbage. Uh, so building, thinking about your user experience and how the user is going to interact and how potentially to protect your user from this garbage, uh, if, if there is garbage, uh, I think is key when you're going from prototype to production because effectively, as, as Billy just pointed out, we're, the questions that we get about problems with LLMs are essentially the same questions we've been trying to overcome for the past 10 years. Like how often do you train? How do you go from prototype to production? Uh, and here, especially with, with LLMs, it's so fast. You, you get to like your production where you have some kind of API and all of a sudden it's behind some web app. We have all the tools to make it possible. You get there so fast that you forget uh, about designing the actual experience to allow the user to take advantage of this capability. So maybe not, maybe obvious, maybe not obvious, but I see a lot of focus that happens on kind of fine tuning the, the piping behind getting the, the models and the entire kind of uh, LLM or your favorite image generation set up to work, but very little focus on the user experience. Uh, and especially around how do you protect your user and then how do you design the experience so if the user is like stuck somewhere with uh, with a bad output or something that doesn't make sense, how do they get unstuck? How do they get back to, um, to a good experience? So um, I was actually just at a conference where we spent quite a bit of time talking about this, uh, learning from a bunch of uh, builders like uh, typeface, I think, is a great example. They have like a ton of customers who are using uh, both image uh, generative experiences and language generative experiences. And uh, one of the cool insights is building the user interface that allows for this iteration. Because, like, I mean, it's it's not particularly expensive. Every time the user clicks a button to refresh, you can return potentially a different outcome. Um, so, thinking about that, it's a very now iterative process to. Uh, to kind of use this uh, the software and then thinking about guardrails. So if like basic output checking uh, and in many cases, basic input checking, just to make sure your users are not leaking PII into your application. If you're like a startup and you're, you know, you just have this one model you're running, you're sending everything to, you know, a public open AI endpoint, like just be very careful about that and um, make sure that your users are not in trouble because they're using um, your your awesome application. So guard railing uh, and user experiences, I would say two things that are typically an afterthought and tends to be pretty dangerous. Alicia, thank you so much. Um, let's go to Chris, uh, then Vile, then uh, I think Miriam wanted to jump in as well. Um, Chris, let's go to you first. Yeah, uh, I think like versioning software, versioning tools, you can't do these things without them. I don't just mean for like uh, code, uh, but like your data, your indices, right? Like if you're building these RAG applications, being able to version those indexes, be, being able to understand, you know, what what changes, how it changes, uh, these kinds of platforms are absolutely crucial. Uh, without them, we're you know we're we're fighting it blind, and you, you don't want to do that in uh, in today's market. Uh, you know, uh, observability platforms. There's a ton of of, of them. Uh, you know, there's people on the panel who could tell you a lot more about some of those uh, options. But uh, the idea is those are it's crucial, right? We need to version uh, everything from our code to our data. Uh, to our prompts, and we need to be able to see how the system's working. And if we can't do those things, given how modular and kind of crazy these systems can become, and very quickly, uh, you know, you again, you're fighting blind. You really don't want to do that. Chris, thank you. Let's go to uh, Vile, then, then Miriam, then you know, if 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 Hannes, Greg, or or uh, uh, want to jump in, please please do. But let's go for you. Yeah, no, I like hard to avoid self-promotion, like check out Metaflow, check out autobounds.com. Um, 
but uh, I, I think like maybe maybe to add to what everybody has been saying here already, one interesting really long-term trend line when you think about what has been happening with data over decades is that going all the way back to, to SQL, and then like what we did with traditional ML, kind of like one, one interesting trend line there is the amount of compute that's required. So, I mean, like in the old days, like, I don't know, like in 1970s, even running SQL queries at scale, like required compute power that was a lot at that time. But I mean, today, I mean, like, it's not the problem at all. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, big data, I mean, use Snowflake use, I mean, that that's kind of like a quote unquote, the solved problem. And even with traditional ML used to be a problem. I mean, being able to train an XG boost model, I mean, it was a big deal at some point. I mean, like most for most people, like for most use cases, training logistic regression or XG boost is not the problem anymore, kind of a solved problem. But now like what's happening, of course, and I, I think that this is here to stay, is this question that these new models are incredibly computationally intensive. And I, I know that now, of course, like especially this year, we have had the GPU shortage. So I, I think that 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 situation will get better, but also like it will get more heterogeneous. So we have a NVIDIA GPUs and we have Trainium on AWS and like we have a new AMD chips and then we have a TPUs on Google. And, and one interesting thing to consider is that given that all these models will be computationally quite demanding for, for years to come, who knows how long, is that like how do we navigate this space of, of, of like having these different compute resources and compute providers in different places. And I think that that's an interesting challenge that we quite didn't have before because it used to be so that like maybe we were all in on AWS and it was just fine. But now with the, all the GPU stuff happening and so forth, I mean, maybe that is not fine anymore. And like, maybe even you need like that, like a GPU, GPU box under your desk again. And that actually like complicates the software stack quite a bit as well. I yeah. couldn't agree more cool. with with that last comment um the i think we're going to see a lot of people using different software uh, sorry sorry uh, a lot of different gpus and a lot of different hardware for their applications um like this nvidia reliance just isn't going to be able to work considering the demand that's why when we built what we built we built it in a hardware agnostic way um, a lot of the optimization and deployment platforms like only work for NVIDIA or might only work for Intel. And we thought it was really important that actually, you know, our customers have a bank of Intel CPUs, but then also have a bank of AMD GPUs and then also have a bank of NVIDIA. And you kind of want that, that unified deployment framework. So they always get that best deployment every single time. So I, I completely agree that it massively complicates that, that stack. Um, and I guess like uh, just a, a little bit of self-promotion, like we think that one of the biggest issues facing this deployment problem is how computation expensive these models are. Um, and there are a huge number of things you can do from a software point of view to make them much less computation expensive and mean that you use your resources better. Um, and that's exactly why we built uh, Titan Takeoff um, so that every single ML engineer can get that every single time because it's, a full team's job within OpenAI, um, but actually most businesses, uh, you know, don't have the ML engineers or don't have the resources to be able to get those really, really excellent deployments. And Greg, if you got any, uh, any perspective to share here, I'd love to hear your um, your perspective on on you know tools, platforms, or or infrastructure that you find to be indispensable when you know going from prototype to production. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, uh, my my perspective is more from the from the learner and the zero to one kind of startup founder perspective. And when you're sitting there, you know, you're just amazed at the tools that are coming out, SageMaker, Bedrock. You know, you can just kind of one click deploy these foundation models to production if you know what you want. Um, now you can also one click your way into spending a couple thousand dollars overnight. So don't do that. But you know, I think the the tools are there. It's it's more like we need more imagination and creativity on the what what product are you building? One click deployment to production is is everywhere and it's becoming more and more ubiquitous. So, you know that, that's my two cents to add to this uh, this discussion. That's a bit beyond my particular depth. Greg, thank you so much. Uh, I know we're running up on time here. Uh, so many great great questions uh, that I've got lined up and a couple more uh, left here. Um, you know, if you guys wouldn't mind hanging back for a minute or so, I think this this question that came in from the audience, I think is super critical. Um, and it, it's, um, if you got to go, all good. But uh, the question here is, uh, what what are the parts of a valuation pipeline? Um, yeah, 
that that's a, a good good question. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Uh, no, doesn't doesn't look like it. Uh, well, Lisa, <laughs> I'll, yeah, let's I'll hear go. from you. I'll go. Yeah, sure. Parts, parts. Uh, first, uh, what are you measuring? Uh, second essentially what's what's going to define your ground truth so again if we're actually if we're just like look back at helm for a second which is probably industry agreed upon st standard as far as the evaluation there are two pieces to it one is data sets um and it's nice to have the helm data sets but they're super academic and all of the models that you care about they already measured so you don't need to you know use helm data sets to measure your models you just can look at the table that they already measured so think about the data sets uh, what's your data set? What is your how how do you represent your use case in the data set? And it could be as simple as, you know, what are my key prompts? Uh, I forget, I think Hannes was mentioning earlier that there's uh, essentially one path of evaluating is keeping the prompts and making sure that uh, as you're going, being in production, uh, making sure that the prompts that you are uh, that you've originally evaluated around are not drifting uh, too far, like the prompts that you're seeing and user interactions are not drifting too far from those prompts. Collecting prompts uh, in your production sense again that will signify your prototypical use cases. So building out this data set that would essentially be your ground truth data set, uh, and then defining the metrics that you will be using to evaluate which are again use case specific uh if you're working on something very simple like summarization uh experience then you know you you get your rogue and your blue and you potentially have uh, lots of examples from um kind of the fine tuning of uh, uh, prompts that you use prompts and responses but if you're working on something uh very obscure then start with designing your metrics uh and definitely invest into building that data set Lisa, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, was there somebody that want to jump in? There's, oh, all right. Well, thank you so much for for joining. Uh, be sure to check out, um, you know, the 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 tools here that uh, people are representing. Uh, Lisa has got a link kit here. Um, check them out on Y Labs, uh, GitHub Y Labs link kit. Check them out, uh, and then also Miriam has the takeoff uh, server. Um, which is the community version is available. I think that's awesome. Check that out. And then um, Outer Bounds as well. Um, is there a specific repository we should check out at uh, for uh, for Outer Bounds? No, you can check out outerbounds.com. Like it's pretty the blog. Like we have many articles about LLMs and how to use them with open source metaflows. That should be fun. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for being here. Appreciate y'all joining. Take care. Have a good rest of your day, everybody.